um, TI flew me to Texas to interview for a job. And I went to Texas and went to the TI facilities and uh, I met with the manager and I look at the manager and I, he sees my eyes keep looking over here. You know? And all of a sudden he looks over and he says, oh, you're not supposed to see that. It was a desktop machine that had yet to be announced. Today I just realized he's got it. Glasses. <laughs> These are adjustable focus glasses, so I don't have to wear bifocals or trifocals like a lot of you old people. Superfocus.com. I really like them. They're weird. Yes, I, I look like Harry Potter kind of, don't I? But, but they work really well. You just move the little slider. Yeah, that, that works for me. That works for me. Uh, how many of you folks were in, and I think probably a lot of you, were in high school or college when the HP 35 came out? Really? Not that many? Oh. I'll, I'll rephrase that. How many of you, when these calculators came out, you really wanted an HP, but you couldn't quite afford it, so you bought a TI instead? Because we could afford those. Okay, yeah. I my family. How many of you people were rendered twisted, bitter wrecks, and turned to collecting as a way to salve the damage to your psyche by having to live with TI all that long? <laughs> Only a few of us. Yes, but I see Gene is one of them. Gina is the one who said, you should give a talk on the SR60. And I said, Gina, it's an HP conference. He said, no, they'll be fascinated. <laughs> they will be. So I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've got a question. Oh, yes, Who sir. here was born after HP released the HP35? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we need to have that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is David Ramsey. I started collecting HP calculators late 1970s after I had graduated from college, had a job, and could afford them when I didn't need them anymore. So, you know, I, I used my uh, TI-59 last two years of college. And this is my very first PowerPoint slide I've ever put together because I'm an engineer and we don't do this very often, so be gentle. <coughs> Been collecting the calculators. I, I like the scientific handhelds, and a couple of years ago, I had them all. I had all the scientific handhelds, I had all the variations of the scientific handhelds, and so I kind of stopped. I've got lots and lots and lots of them. That's a bird up at the top there. And boxes and manuals. Yes. That looks familiar. I worked at Apple back in the 80s, and you'd, every time I met some new engineer, I'd said, hey, do you have an HP calculator? Oh, yeah, and they always did. That's how you got them in the days before eBay, flea markets. But a couple of years ago, I started looking at some of the desktops, and you know how that starts. I'm just, look, here's a 9825. That was really cool. I remember when that came out. I wanted one. I would have sold my grandmother into slavery, and now I can pick it up for 300 bucks. Yeah, and then, yeah, I would have. I would have. So, uh, oh my there's a 98, yeah, 9825, wow. 46, a 9810, I got a 90, is Larry Atherton here? Where do you live? No. Where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> and then I picked up a absolutely mint 9820 from Larry Atherton last night, and I just keep telling myself, it's only money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of stuff. I wish my wife saw that. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, and then you run out of space for them because they're so big. So you have to start, you know, putting them in decorative positions. That looks great. <laughs> That's my <laughs> problem about that. <laughs> enough about HP. Enough about HP. But this is an SR60 thing. I found this on the auction side. I just happened to see it. And I was like, oh man, an SR60. Those never come up. We won't mention how much I paid for it. A lot. <laughs> A whole lot. It was, rec it was described as working, and I got it in, and it had bad memory and, of course, the gummy reader card wheel, because they all do. Turns out that was fairly easy to fix, so it's fully functional now. But I would like to warn you that I'm not an SR60 expert. I don't think there are any SR60 experts. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's not like HP. You know, if you get an HP 97, you've got schematics and a thousand people that know them inside out, and people writing manuals and how to repair them, and these, you've got nothing. Nothing at all. Okay, here are the specs. Introduced in 76, 1695. Whoa. A year later, they introduced a version with more memory for 995. That doesn't sound right, but it's the best we've been able to figure out. Had 1,200 bytes of memory in the base model, 3,100 bytes in the SR60A, and it used the little TMC 0501 4-bit processor. 
Uh, I cannot find any real technical information <coughs> on this processor. I can't tell you the clock speed it's running at. A couple hundred kilohertz. You know, somebody probably knows, but I don't. And the neat thing about this calculator is it has a full alphanumeric display. Here's a timeline to kind of put it in perspective. This is my virtual laser pointer. 9968. <laughs> and the batteries never run out. So we have the 9810 and 71, bing, 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 bing. So by the time the SR60 is out, we've got a pretty good stable of HP machines that are competitive with it. As far as I know, as far as I know, this is the only desktop programmable HP ever came out with. Yeah. Yeah. Say what? TI. Thank you. The only desktop programmable TI ever came out with. So let's look at it. Uh, on the left side of the keyboard, we have scientific keys, memory keys. We've got a real cool key label, limited precision, that latches down and that truncates all precision to the display length. So if you say fix four, everything's calculated. The reason they did this is because this thing is so damn slow, I can beat it in my curta sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some timing tests later. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yeah. yeah. What, what's the E1 key and stuff over there? Oh. Unsh Normally, they're just, you know, degrees, radian, sine, cosine, tangent. These are the some keys that in program mode, if you assign them to a label, when you punch that key, it just jumps to the label. It's like the ABCDE on the HP calculators. The middle keyboard, we've got numeric pad, square root, X root, some parentheses, and a real interesting set of keys along the top here. Yes, no, not apply, not known, and enter. Crazy logic. <laughs> no, no, no. This is why Texas Instruments actually called it, although I didn't really have room to fit it up here. It is a prompting programmable calculator. We'll get into that soon. Prompting, yes. On the right side of the keyboard, you've got more alpha keys. You've got more label keys, E1 through E5. And most of the other functions are, you know, read, indirect, write, list, if near, if positive, subroutine jumps, blah, blah, just the program control stuff. Because this is a keystroke program or calculator like we're all familiar with. Hardware, this is where it's really different. Old HP calculators, like a 9810, even 9825, those things are built like tanks. You know, if I were bringing one of those, I'd just throw it in the trunk of the car and drive down here. I wouldn't, for example, taking a hypothetical situation, go to a camera store, spend $215 in a case or an anti-static bag, wrap it up here, bring it here, and find it doesn't work anyway. <laughs> HP calculator strong like bull, SR60 duck up like butterfly. <laughs> so if you take the top off, this doesn't show very well, I apologize. The base is cast aluminum. You can see a printer. Alphanumeric display, the card reader slots, there's kind of a divot in the display. And all the calculator electronics are on a PC board under the keyboard in this area. The actual PC board. Not like that. From the rear, here's the card reader. Uh, other people that actually know something about electronics have said this is a combination linear power supply for the card reader and the logic and the display and a switching power supply for the printer. Uh, okay, I'll buy that. Uh, you might notice a DB25 connector and a ribbon cable here. That's what TI calls the aux connector, auxiliary. And some of the documentation mentions things like an electric typewriter you could hook up or a cassette drive. I've not been able to find any information either of these ever existed. So, here's another shot of the motherboard. It's on the bottom of the keyboard. You can see the keys here. Every chip in there, except the CPU and the ROMs, is socketed. Now think about this awesome. for a moment. It's socketed, and we all know that's going to be a little less reliable, but maybe they wanted to make it easy to repair. But this is on the underside of the keyboard, so all of these chips are hanging upside down in their sockets. So, yes, so what happens when it's like 20 years old and it gets moved a lot? I, I have opened one up where the chips were on the bottom of the case and the sockets were empty. Fortunately, that was a parts machine. Yeah. And all this, of course, this is all PMOS circuitry, and as I've told several people here, if I jump a spark here and it's out there on the uh, registration table, I just killed it. That's how sensitive it is. Oh, and it is out there at the registration table. It is plugged in. It seems to be fully functioning. 
feel free to go play with it. Uh, it's going to die someday. I think of it like a bottle of water, and every time I turn it on, it's like taking a swig. Yes. Can we pick it up and drop it? On Please don't. No. <laughs> don't. Don't deliberately Not try to kill it. Don't deliberately try to kill it. But if it has to die, I really can't think of a better place. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I can't replace it no matter how much you put me. Please don't drop it. How Go play with it. How big are the popsicle sticks for? Popsicle sticks. You know, the guards. Oh, you thank go. you for mentioning that. I forgot to bring up my props. Here it is. Here it is. Here. Oh. Okay, Gene, oh, you give it to me. Oh, give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> no. Here is a mag card. Let me take it out of the thing. This is a mag card for an SR60. Now, everybody's going, wow, that's big. Here's a mag card for 9810. Now, let's look at this. These are dimensionally identical to within a fraction of a millimeter. The only difference in the cards is the printing on them, and the HP cards have a little punch out to write protect them, whereas the TI cards, you put a little piece of black tape on them to write to them, to write enable them. Is it is the media compatible? I yes, think. yes. I have I actually put a piece of black tape in the HP card and the TI red. I can only assume these were made by the same company. I mean, they are identical. Oh, wow. You can pass these around. Interesting. How many HP 65 cards did you try to Oh, gosh. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, but a question. How many yes. bytes can you record in one of those? I'll get to that. I, actually, I don't know what it would be in Five bytes. Five gigabytes. <laughs> it's uh, 480 steps on one side of the TI card. 480 keystrokes and... I don't know how they're encoded, so I couldn't tell you the bytes. They were like 512. Possibly. Uh, continuing the shoddy and poor design and construction, <laughs> uh, the display, the printer, and the card reader are connected with these laminated flex cables. They just have bare ends poking out, and they are not keyed. Guess what happens if you plug it in backwards and turn it on? So the first thing you do is you take your Sharpie pen and you mark them. Uh, in my unit out there, two of the three cables have started delaminating. This goes with my analogy of every time I turn it on, it's like taking a drink of water out of the bottle, and eventually the bottle's going to be empty. Here's the PC board. Again, it's about like yay. And I have outlined the CPU in red. That's a little 4-bit CPU. It's got 16-digit precision. It's not quite a system on a chip by modern standards, but it does have keyboard and display drivers in it requires at least one ROM, in the SR60 it has two, and the one interesting thing is they use the CPU and a whole bunch of calculators, most of the, the 59, the 58, the 56, the 57, blah, blah, all use the same CPU. Not the 57. So I guess if it died, I could try to unsolder it. <laughs> right above that are two of these TMCO 582 ROMs. This sounds funny, but the specs I've got say it uses 13-bit words. Uh, there are two of them in a stacked arrangement, and again, this and the processor are both soldered in the board. Everything else is socketed. Here are the memory chips, TMC0599. Each one is 1920 bits for 1200 bytes total. Each chip is 240 program registers, or program steps, or 30 data registers, and there are 16 pin packages. So these two are stacked, and that's a singleton, so there are five chips total. And these are still socketed. There are slots for two memory boards that have more of those chips on them. Now, oddly, there are two boards, and one has three chips and one has five chips. Why they don't each have four is another one of these enduring mysteries for the ages. <laughs> I, I don't know. At the side here is a wide edge connector for an additional memory board that I've heard of, but I can't find anyone that's ever actually seen one. So it may or may not have ever existed. <laughs> Here are all the connectors in the board. There's a keyboard connector there, and it's bolted to the bottom of the keyboard, and it just kind of plugs in. Here are those laminated cable connectors on the display, the card reader, the auxiliary connector in the back, and the printer, which is another one of those stupid laminated connectors. I hate that connector. I really hate it. Here are the cards that people are passing around. Again, they must be made by the same company. Programming. How many of you guys are programmers? <laughs> oh, good. I, I love being among programmers. 
It's a keystroke programmable calculator with no merged keystrokes, limited alpha capabilities, and the display, as you can see if you go outside and play with it, shows mnemonics rather than key codes. This is a huge win, as I'm sure you know. If you pick up something like a 15C to pull something out of the air and you haven't used it in a month or two, unless you're like some weird idiot savant, and I'm not going to point any fingers here, you probably need to stop and go, oh, four, two, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you have to count your keys for a while. But here, you've just got the mnemonics. It's very nice. Full program editing, we've got uh, step, back step, insert, and delete, although insert and delete can take uh, a little while if you've got a long program. One nice thing about the TI, this is the first calculator I know that actually builds a little internal jump table that keeps track of the labels. So although you can go to numeric addresses, there's hardly any ever reason to do so because going to a label is just as fast. When you take it out of learn mode, it sits there and flickers its display for a few seconds while it runs through the program and builds the jump table. That's kind of cool. There are only three conditional tests, if error, if positive, and if zero, and you can invert the meanings of them with the second key, so you get if no error, if negative, if not zero. Now in our HPs, if we want to test to see if something's equal to five, we put five in the stack, push it in, put five in X, say if X is equal to Y, very simple. The TI-59, which used the same processor, had a special T register. You put a comparison in T and say if X is equal to T. This is like assembly language. If you want to see something is equal to 5, you subtract 5 from it and see if the result is 0. Destructive, clunky, but hey, it was 1976. There is a special sequence, second key, go to, and that does a decrement and skip in 0 and whatever's in register 0 and that's the only decrement register. So you can, nested loops are, again, kind of clunky. We have 10 flags and 12 levels of subroutines. Mm -hmm. Overkill, probably, but nice to have. We have full indirect addressing and indirect register arithmetic and indirect go to and go sub, also nice. Here's where we get into the prompting part. There's a key at the bottom of the right keyboard labeled QUE for question. And what that does is halt the calculator program and display whatever's in the alpha register. And then, right after you press that Q, way, I don't know how you pronounce that question. Let's just say question key. Okay. 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 <laughs> you put four labels, and it will jump to the first label when you press yes, the second label when you press no, the third when you press not apply, the fourth when you press not known, and continue after that if you press enter. So with a little upfront work, it was very easy to write a program that a non-technical user could use, and their classic example was the time value of money program. It would prompt for the things, you'd say, do you have this? Yes, enter it. Oh, I don't know this one. I see a question. So this is the first TI calculator I've ever seen that has an enter key? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. But it doesn't do what you think it does. Uh, you can repartition memory. And with an SR60A like I have, when you turn it on, it comes up with 1920 program steps and 100 registers. To change that, you put in the number of registers you want divided by 10. So if you want 50 registers, you put in 5, partition, and then you get 50 registers and everything else is program memory. So let's write a program. What I did, I wrote a really little program and it iterates through the integers, or decrements I should say, 9 to 1, computes the cube of each integer and puts that into the like numbered register. So we start with the cube of 9, we put that in register 9, the cube of 8, put that in register 8. Trivial stuff. Let's see how long that takes. Here's the program in the SR60. And you'll actually notice here I did a cube by recall, 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 multiply, because the SR60, like a lot of old HP calculators, doesn't give integer answers to raising integers to integer powers. And it was either that or add 0.5 and truncate. So simple program. It takes about seven seconds to run. Let's try it the 9810. After all, the 9810 came out like, what, four years earlier? You, say what? 71. 71, five years earlier. Well, oh, I'm sorry, I did a 98, well, there's a 9810. Uh, it's got a 
weird version of RPN if you've ever had to work with it. It doesn't work like we're used to. It's got a very limited instruction set, and it takes about half a second to run that program. <laughs> yeah, so. 9815, which as we all know, is one of the few HP calculators to use a commercial processor, the 6800 from Motorola. That does it in one and a half seconds. So the SR60 ain't very fast. So I was telling Gene this, and he said, oh, 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 Dave, oh, 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 Dave, oh, 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 Dave. <laughs> yeah, like that. What you have to do is write a program that does nothing but add one in a loop. <laughs> yeah, he's talked to you guys too, huh? <laughs> and run it for 60 seconds and see how far it gets. Well, that's how I benchmark all my programs. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about giving a TI presentation to you guys anyway. Here are the results. The SR60 <laughs> gets to 344 after a minute of adding one in a loop. The 9810 gets to 12,453, and the 9815 gets to 25,913. Wow, right. Yeah. So to sum up, we have pros and cons. It is cheaper than equivalent HP products, especially in the second year where it was only 995 and all the equivalent HPs were much more expensive. Better program editing. If you really want to giggle, Read the 9810 manual and how to do live program editing to insert or delete steps. Basically, they have you record sections of the program in a card and then read them back in at a different address. So, full alphanumeric display. Arguably easier to set up for non-technical users because of set alphanumeric display. And it's really, really easy to repair the gummy wheel on the card reader. It's the easiest card reader repair I've ever done. I loved it. On the downside, it is unbelievably slow. Really, really slow. Delicate like a butterfly. Like I mentioned, I got here yesterday, I took it out of the fancy case with three inches of foam and inside, took it out of the anti-static bag, plugged it in, dead as a doornail. Took it completely apart, reseated all the chips, sprayed the things with contact cleaner, wiggled the things, now it's working. You know, what was wrong? I don't know. I really don't. And since they're all custom TI chips, I'm never going to know. I just, you know, I just I just prayed and it's it's alive now. It's, and that gets to another disadvantage, constructed entirely of unavailable custom chips, <laughs> clumsy conditionals, and no collector base. Like I said, I'm not an expert. I don't think there are any experts. Probably all the people that ever <coughs> designed more on TI are, you're an expert. Start a club. <laughs> but he'll be the only member. A fellow, a fellow named York Warner has already done that. And he's got a list of, I think, five other people that own these things. <laughs> and none Have of a them. conference. Say what? Have a conference. Have a conference. Oh, it, yeah, it'd be just as exciting as this. And love it, you know. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we'd want to bring our machines, and then this the physical act of transporting them would destroy most of them. So, yeah. Uh, credits. Do their 60Cs work? Yes. I don't know if they are, quote, fully functional, like mine. Eh. I, you know, mine is fully functional when it actually turns on. The card reader works, I repaired it, the printer works, blah, blah, but sometimes when I turn it on, nothing happens, and then it's not functional at all. So you have to kind of stretch your definitions a little bit. If I've written a decent presentation, it's because I stole a lot of this from websites from people who know more about it than I do. Uh, we all know, most of us know your Warner, datamath.org. That's where I got most of the stuff. He's actually collected a lot of the chip information. Not the stuff we'd like to know, like clock speed, bus width, and such. I think it's an entirely serial machine internally. Uh, Oldcalculatormuseum.com and victortossrskey.org. Now, the one big problem I had, and I have tried to do a public service here, manuals. Can't find any. Never found any manuals. Finally, somebody said, hey, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California has a set of manuals. So I called them. Well, I emailed them. They said, yeah, we got some manuals. Can I come look at them? No problem. Can I come scan them? No. <laughs> OK. I said, maybe I could sneak in one of those little pen scanners. <laughs> we'll scan them for you. Cool. How much? All you have, yeah, I'm getting to that. <laughs> All you have to do is become a member. Becoming a member is $175. Okay, I made a lot of money in Silicon Valley. I can afford that. Then it's 50 cents a page. Oh. <laughs> $500 later, we have a set of manuals. They are available here for everyone. Thank you. So that's what
the Pirates of the Caribbean are doing nowadays, scanning <laughs> manuals for TI and all. No, I, I don't really begrudge on that. If you ever are in Mountain View, California, you have to visit the Computer History Museum. It is absolutely fantastic, yeah. and, you know, I, I don't blame them for not letting me scan them, because I probably would have screwed them up, and I don't blame them for not automatically scanning everything they get, because they've got warehouses documentation, so I'm actually glad to have been able to done it. do it. The machine itself, due to a lack of space in here, is sitting at the registration table. It's plugged in. It Feel free to turn it on and play with it. It was working a few minutes ago. So, you know, let's cross our fingers. Uh, if you have any questions, come grab me. Does anybody have any questions now? Or can I leave? And, yes. I can back up one slide. I believe you all have copies of this on the... Right on the board. They're in the proceedings, although you might have to use a magnifying glass to read them. Can you go forward again? I almost got the thing in there. Are you finished? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Question? I think that the quality should try. Yes. If you read the manual and I wrote this, thank you for the manual. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, yes, yes. Um, it has a kind of shortened addresses. The number of digits you need for the addressing memory or program steps depends on how much memories built into the state. To some degree, you can you can short circuit the memory addresses. You don't need to put leading zeros in if the subsequent instruction is non-numeric. So if you've got it set for say 500 memories and you want to recall memory five, recall 005 will work, but recall five will also work as long as the very next keystroke is not a number. Yeah. So you can say recall five times. In fact, if you're recalling memory zero, you don't even need the zero. You can say recall times. That'll uh -huh. suck memory zero. The interesting thing is this is recorded as is in the program. So in the program, it, uh, the leading zeros are not inserted. That's different from the 59 and the 52. If you use short and address addressing on those, and you have a program, the, the, the zeros are re uh, actually filled in. Yeah. At least I know on the 59 I know it. Ah. Uh, on the 60, uh, the, le the leading zeros are not filled in. You have to uh, adhere to the memory size of the machine for correct addressing. Yes. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize it was pocket size. <laughs> Don't touch zero one. Wow. Yes. Well, unfortunately, I'm not in Reno right now, so the suspicious-looking pocket print on my pants is merely a suspicious-looking pocket print. Uh, <laughs> please don't run off with my SR60. <laughs> HP won't let us. <laughs> yes. How's the printing on the SR60? Can you get clear printouts? Oh and, yes, it looks wonderful. And what type of, is it infrared? It's, it's a thermal printer. It's, as far as I can tell, it's the exact same print mechanism out of one of those PC100 print printers. It's a resistive thermal printer, 20 characters. Basically, it's a clone of the display. And I was fortunate, the, the machine I got, the printer works perfectly, I didn't need to do anything. Just the only thing is finding the two and one quarter inch wide thermal paper. And some guy often, some, I've even forgotten the country in Europe, cranked out a bunch of them and I ordered like 15 rolls of it over eBay like four months ago and so now I've got paper that will fit. Uh, they have two inch paper that kind of wanders back and forth. There's no moving head. There's no moving head. No, it's a line there. Uh, it's, it's a line of, of uh, heating uh, oh, resistance or something yeah. like that. Oh, it's full width. Yeah. Full width. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really fast and very crisp. Yeah, it's pretty right good. Thing. I mean, go out there, put some stuff in the display, punch the print button, see for yourself. Is it blue or black? It's, uh, it depends on the paper. Right now it's black. Yes? Uh, what kind of work, what, what, you, what use and what kind of work are you performing on this machine? <laughs> yeah, right. It's slowly. It, it, yes, it would be, I, I, I put it on a shelf, I have little spotlights on it, and every other week I come with a, you know, a feather and dust it <laughs> while wearing my anti-static suit. Time <laughs> well, factorization. It's okay. Right factorization? Oh, <laughs> get your Florida calculator to be faster. <laughs> yeah, so basically what we have is a historically interesting machine that's, for whatever reason, very rare and hard to get. It's kind of cool, and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Okay.